Hello, Adrian. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me to speak to the Arcade Attack fan community. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, let's see. You had a first question, and it was like this: How did you first get into the video game industry, and what was the first game you ever worked on? Well, um, my brother Rick had gone to school in Pomona, California with a fellow named Dave Warhol. Uh, Dave was his roommate. So uh, after college days ended, uh, not long after, uh, they uh, they stayed roommates, I think, for a little while. They had a little cabin. Where was it? In Idlewild, in the desert. There were bees in the wall, that kind of thing. Um, anyway, long story short, um, I was into video games. I could see that it was a frontier that was largely unexplored. Um, and I wanted to do that. I wanted to be, I wanted to be like the Beatles in any way possible, but the Beatles uh, had been exploring, uh, you know, they, they were trailblazers. And to be a trailblazer, you have to cut trails. And most of the trees in music had been cut down. And I could see that uh, that there was plenty to explore in video games. So I wanted to get into video games. When Dave Warhol uh, I was, started working at Intellivision, well, he'd been there for a while. When I found that out, I asked if I could get into video games some way. And I didn't really know anything about programming or that. But uh, I said, you know, I just want to get into this business. So I'll take out your trash cans for you if you want to for free. Uh, whatever, what do I have to do? And he said, well, you're kind of a, you're a composer, aren't you? Well, I'd gotten a degree in music, but I hadn't really, you know, in composing, but it was by the skin of my teeth. Um, but I said, yeah, a little bit. And he said, well, I need a song for uh, ice skating penguins. I said, well, I, I can do that. And uh, so kind of the unspoken agreement was that I'd do it for free. Uh, so I got out my... Uh, this was for for Thin Ice on Intellivision, which uh, was, you know, an ice, ice skating penguins. Um, so 10 second song. Uh, I got out my reel to reel recorder and uh, I played a little bit of guitar into it. You know, a little boop beat doot deet doot deet doot deet line. Uh, and then I um, played a melody on another track. And when I got it to where after a lot of takes... Uh, I finally got it to where it sounded pretty good, and then I transcribed that into music notation, gave it to Dave, and he programmed it into the game. Um, and that was Thin Ice. Uh, in television, uh, found out that I'd done it for free, and the lawyers said, no, we got to pay him. How much does he want? <laughs> so I said, what did I say, 1200 bucks or something like that. So I got, you know, I think I ended up getting a 1000 bucks for a 10-second tune. And... Uh, uh, they the company went out of business shortly thereafter. I don't know if I caused it. Um, and a similar thing happened uh, as my next couple of projects were on uh, Atari, and Atari went through massive reorganization. So this was the sort of uh, great gaming crash of 1984. Sorry, that was a little long-winded. Let's see what your next question is. This, sa this says, you have worked on so many classic titles such as Wing Commander, Loom, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, and The Seventh Guest, spanning many genres, platforms, and companies. Which game soundtracks are you most proud of? Well, I'm very proud of Wing Commander, Loom, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, and The Seventh Guest, that's for sure. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I'm particularly proud of uh, Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo. Uh, lately, I've been pretty excited about Freddy Fish. Um... And uh, uh, and once once you know the the main thing about Pup Pet Saves the Zoo is that I had the whole team working in concert again you know with the the Beatles as that guiding star uh, I wanted everybody do working to their strengths and working as a team and bringing what they could uh, you know bringing variety but with unified themes. Uh, to the music, and we achieved that, and we had a great time doing it. Uh, actually, kind of more like the the Monkees than the Beatles. Uh, it, it was very uh, it was very fun. I mean, we were dressing up like cowboys and and trying to do the right thing. 
uh, with our best pals. Um, so I was very proud that I pulled that off and that it was musically pretty together, you know, and we covered a lot of uh, genres. Um, and uh, I think that there's some emotionally impactful stuff and uh, it had impact on people when they were young and impactable. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit proud of that, but I'm prone to be proud. I've got a very supportive family. Uh, it says here you worked on so many classic LucasArts titles, such as Loom and Maniac Mansion. What was it like creating music for this awesome company? And do you have a personal favorite soundtrack from any of these games? Um, yeah, you know, Loom and Maniac Mansion um, are, are pretty good. Um, I mean, Loom is the music from Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky. And uh, I leaned into that and did some things that I just don't think anybody else had done before. Uh, not for lack of, uh, you know, not for lack of talent, but it, they just kind of, MIDI music hadn't really been treated as something musical yet. Uh, people hadn't sped up and slowed down songs. They'd only copied scores. I think that it was, it, there just hadn't been that many musicians that I was aware of uh, doing, just working in the field. So it was easy to kind of raise the bar of course, I'm probably being ignorant and arrogant. Uh, there were probably people doing amazing stuff, but just by by using dynamics and and uh, tempo changes, uh, I was able to bring a hint of what Seiji Ozawa brought when he conducted the Swan Lake scores, um, and I sort of copied what he was doing on his record uh, on on the CD, um, but that it uh it with that powerful music uh just being a part of bringing that music to listeners and gamers uh you talk about having an opportunity to kind of raise the bar i mean i was just in the right place at the right time uh representing you know getting the glory that's due to tchaikovsky and uh and due to brian moriarty who was my producer who actually whose idea it was to use that music so uh, i'm proud of it but uh, it was easy glory. Um, then Maniac Mansion I'm proud of for an entirely different reason. Um, I really enjoyed starting to, I was starting to pull my team together. Uh, Dave Govett did a couple of tunes and uh, I, I think the compositions on that are, are pretty cool. And I, uh, Dave Warhol again was my producer on that. And he was pushing me to write out there music. Um, he would always hold up things like the Jetsons theme and a Rocky and Bullwinkle theme as examples of great music that pushed the boundaries of tonality and harmony and melody. Uh, ba 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 ba, you know that kind of thing. Ba 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 da, you know, just just kind of odd leaps and uh, and jarring. Uh, Apagaturas, that's an accented passing tone. Um, ba -da, you know, it, the, da is the note you're going for, da, you know, hitting that one hard. Um, so he pushed me in that direction, and I think that the, uh, the, some of the music in Maniac Mansion hits that, uh, especially the, the unused Dr. Fred uh, tune, which you can find on YouTube. So, uh, yeah, and what was it like working for that company? I mostly just worked at home. Uh, I was working remote, baby. I didn't need 2020 to know that telecommuting was a good idea. I, I had started doing that in uh, 1984 or so. Um, and uh, I uh, communicated by fax and phone and modem. That, uh, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. What's the next question? You worked on all three games within the Seventh Guest universe, including the fan-made Thirteenth Doll. What was it like working on these three games, and what inspired your spooky soundtracks? Well, let me just say, the Thirteenth Doll, uh, the credit goes to the fans who made that game. They, they did a great job with it. Um, I really mostly just did legal licensing, you know, just tried to make it so that they could use the music that I'd already written. 
Uh, but, uh, and then they, you know, used that as a starting point and, and took off with it. So they're to credit for that. Uh, seventh Guest and Eleventh Hour. Well, Seventh Guest, I, I was inspired by the fact that I was getting to work with, uh, well, at first I, I was inspired just to have a nice job. Um, Graham Devine knew that I had worked on Wing Commander and uh, he held me in high esteem when he approached me and asked me to work on his game. And I was a little bit arrogant, you know, a little bit haughty. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll work on your little game. Uh, but when they sent me the videotape of that first scene of going up the stairs, I knew that I was on to something fantastic and that would be of lasting value. So I was very inspired by that. And I was inspired by uh, Graham being really encouraging and giving me a lot of rope. Uh, sometimes it took uh, a little bit of faith on my part because they were the company wasn't getting back to me with a lot of feedback. But on the other hand, it was great not to be nagged. Um, and uh, I would dig into my sort of spookiest but mostly grooviest uh, musical memories. So uh, I would think about uh, sometimes the bad guy music in like Batman, you know, the TV show. Or uh, there was a Twilight Zone episode about the one-armed bandit. And uh, it was kind of a boot. Dun, 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 dun. Well, uh, and uh, I kind of wanted to do that. That's in the downstairs. That shows up in the downstairs piece. Uh, so I would dig into those things, but I would also uh, look at uh, Rain in 11th Hour is uh, inspired by uh, tubular bells uh, or, or, is, or, or there's also Funky Tubes is, is somewhat uh, inspired by tubular bells, but I would start like, uh, emulating the vibe of these tunes and I would get way off track, uh, which is a great way to do it. So I like having sort of an inspiration starting point and then doing it wrong. Uh, I have this belief that that's what the Beatles did. They were trying to do R and B and they were kind of missing the mark in a fabulous way. And I think that that's a great way to write music. So there, there's, and I was left, you know, every day I would sit down at the keyboard and go, what's my favorite tune, what I feel like playing right now? And then I would bend it into something scary. So that's a very inspirational way to do it. Thanks for asking. Next. You have again worked on many Wing Commander games. What helped inspire your space slash sci-fi soundtrack and how do you reflect on these particular titles? Well, uh, Chris Roberts was a big movie buff and he asked us to do something like the first Star Trek movie had come out, there had only been one, and uh, Star Wars. Um, and uh, I was happy to get the gig, but I was a little bit busy, and I had just started working with Dave Govett, and I mentioned the gig to him, and he said that he had something that had been rolling around. He was a huge John Williams fan, and he said he'd had something kind of rolling around in his head for a while, uh, you know, since high school, which hadn't been that long. Um, and all he needed to do was kind of capture it in MIDI. You know, it had just been up here. So I think oh, a couple of days later, a week later, he came up with uh, the two major pieces from that game. The uh, uh, the dogfight music, you know, the fighting music, and uh, the main theme. So that's all entirely due to the genius of Dave Govett. Uh, and then I, my role was to take those themes and improv off of them for things like the arcade theme and, and uh, uh, landing things and um, ejecting, uh, things like that. So, so he was kind of the, the, the main theme was his. And then from then on, I had to kind of remind him to echo, echo the themes, keep the themes coming back so that we weren't just wandering off because he was just full of melodic ideas. Um, and, uh, and my, my gig, and this, this, this happened throughout the story of Team Fat is that, uh, and coming up with a, a motif, you know, just a little musical, something you can hang on to, 
uh, and then having it echo here and there, maybe with variations for being happy, sad, belonging to some character or another. Um, so that was fun to do. And, uh, and I think that we just worked hand in glove. We, we just had a great relationship for that. Um, and the way that I reflect on it, uh, I kind of feel like we were the first... If, if you look at where game music was at that time, I've never heard it disputed. I think we were the first people to imitate John Williams for a game soundtrack, which became... It really became a thing, um, you know, for many years. It was like, make it more like John Williams, make it more like Danny Elfman. Uh, but since it was, since there weren't that many people doing it then, um, we got the first shot at that. And I think Dave just hit it out of the ballpark. Also, uh, we were, for the first time, getting to support the new sound cards. Uh, so, like, at the same time, we were working on Loom and Wing Commander, and then there was a, a King's Quest game or two, uh, that were coming out for MT32. So even though not a lot of people heard it that way, because not a lot of people own that soundtrack, uh, we were showing up very well because the soundtrack would get played on that uh, at trade shows. So we we're again, we were like right place, right time, and Dave just hit it out of the park with something that just hadn't really been done before. Um, and on top of that, uh, interactive soundtrack... Uh, which, by the way, showed, when it was showed at the trade shows, they said it was an interactive soundtrack. They showed a clip of a dogfight, and they played the dogfight music exactly as Dave had composed it from the beginning to the end. And people just raved about the interactive soundtrack, but it really wasn't interactive yet. Uh, we ended up, you know, when Chris added the idea of interactive soundtrack... His idea was take the piece you've already written and cut it into little parts and label them. You are chasing the missile. The missile is chasing you. Your wingman's been hit, etc. So we did that. And then the smart people, uh, who I think included Herman Miller and uh, Mark Schaefkin. I'm still very good friends with him and was in a band with him for a good long time. The captains of the chess team. <laughs> captains of the chess team. Um, nerd band. Um but they did the heavy lifting and made it uh, interactive. Uh, we only worked on Wing 1, uh, and the powers that be were eager to replace us uh, once we... Many classic gaming title soundtracks are now being sold on vinyl via companies such as Data Discs. Ooh, Data Discs. I should write that down. What are your views that VGM is so truly loved, and can we expect to see any of your gaming classic soundtracks being released on vinyl? Uh, VGM being truly loved, I'm glad that it's loved. Um, I really... Uh, I... Until like this year, I kind of haven't seen any upside to that. But this year it's starting to break for me, and I'm so, so grateful. Um, now that my stuff is available on Bandcamp, and uh, and I'm putting it out on, uh, on you know, distributing it to Apple Music and, and uh, Spotify and such, um, thank you to you YouTubers who are generating original content, when you get a copyright claim from me, thank you for being tolerant of that. Uh, let me know if it causes you a lot of trouble, but hopefully it doesn't. And I'm starting to get micro pennies and I'm very excited about that. Thank you. So my opinion of VGM music being popular is thank you for loving it. I think it's starting to do me some good now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as far as vinyl, I would love to reward uh, the, uh, the, the game fans with vinyl. Uh, and let me just put an end to the rumors that the Seventh Guest, Guest and Eleventh Hour Comeback albums uh, would have a uh, Halloween release on vinyl this year. Uh, 
I am absolutely not saying that. And uh, that is the way that rumors get started. So please, when you spread the word, bear in mind that uh, I did not say that that was going to happen. Because you didn't hear it from me. Unreleased ga gems. Unreleased gems. You know what I really liked was I worked on a children's game called Zippity. Uh, and I may just release that on Bandcamp. Uh, I did about five songs. Um, and they were songs. And they've got some pretty cute lyrics. Uh, I tried to do sort of a Gilligan's Island opening theme where you could understand the entire universe just listening to the lyrics. So in the center of the net, there's a stream that isn't wet and it's glowing because it's flowing with good data from the Zoggins who were chased, from, from the Zipsters who were chased by the Zoggins who were replaced by, by, who were by the Zagun Zort and Zog the Zipster. Hater. That's the rhyme. But they're happy when it ends because they all end up as friends and the, 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 you know, it, 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 yeah, yeah, I worked on some stuff. Uh, there were some, uh, some projects that, where we'd be hired for like five different projects that all had the same, uh, basic theme and none of them shipped. So like a bunch of different companies would call me and say, oh, I'm doing a Warcraft killer. It's going to be like Warcraft when it's going to have five races, uh, you know, Warcraft didn't have very many races. It's like Warcraft was going to have three races. And like a bunch of people were asking for that. And it all happened about like, oh, it's a planet that's like Earth. They all revolved around this sort of Earth uh, being taken over by aliens one way or the other. Um, so I wrote a tune called No Man on Earth, which would go with, I think No Man's Earth was one of them. And there were other, there were like three others that 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 could have been a theme for. So while I was selling, uh, you know, pitching those games, I wrote that too. And so you'll, you'll find No Man on Earth. It's on, uh, it's on Spotify, but it's kind of a crazy song with the uh, elaborate lyrics that would go with any of three games, but also would be a, uh, a love song, a, a song of love gone horribly wrong. Um, what else is unreleased? If I think of something else, I'll, I'll bung it into the next question. How do you reflect on your video game music career and which soundtrack are you most proud of and why? I'm most proud of, you know, earlier I had said, Put Put Saves the Zoo, but I don't know. I'm reflecting on my music career. That's, this is how I reflect on my music career. It's been a good run. I am incredibly lucky to have gotten to do this. It is different now. Um, and, uh, but it's not worse. Um, I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, and it was about the friends you meet along the way, you know, team fat and, uh, raising a couple of kids while I was working and getting to where, the cowboy clothes and, and actually live the dream of being like the, the monkeys or the Beatles or whatever, Team Bonsai and Buckaroo Bonsai. You know, I actually had a taste of that. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And I also feel like uh, if I looked at it from a personal point of view, I could say, well, I got kind of got forgotten and for all how significant... Uh, for how loved and how listened to this music was, you know, what have I got to show for it? But I've got a whole life to show for it. Uh, you know, if, if you define success as, as living well and, and never actually starving, uh, I'm very fortunate and very uh, happy. Um, I'm, I'm real solid with that. And uh, now... Fans are starting to buy stuff on Bandcamp, and uh, I'm getting those micro pennies from uh, from YouTube. So, thank you guys. Keep it up. Keep watching those YouTubes. Keep downloading the Bandcamp. I really appreciate it. Uh, and if there's uh, ways I can help you out, let me know. Can you run us through a typical day of writing music for a video game, and how long does it typically take? 
to start and complete a track. Uh, I think if I if I've got uh, if I'm lucky, half an hour, but that's rare. No, I don't think I can do it in a half hour, two hours. Um, a, a typical day of writing music, uh, a lot of times it gets hijacked by things like like interviews, because I'm putting off some writing right now. Paid clients, you know. Um, but uh, usually, you know, I have a little coffee, uh, sit down at the machinery, and if it's a song, you know, I've got the guitar and, and paper and Evernote, you know, I'm writing in uh, lyrics. I'm doing a lot of songs these days. Um, if it's a production piece, uh, I've got four screens here. Is what it looks like. One, two, three, four. And little keyboards here. Do, do, do. And guitars over there. Do, do, do. Always kind of within reach. A couple amps and things. Um, and there's plenty of other stuff in the other rooms. And so, uh, typical day, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll bring up a a project in uh, Nuendo, and I'll struggle with a little tech, but on a good day, I'm not struggling with tech, and uh, uh, pop a couple of ideas in, and I get either either start one in a day or finish one in a day. I'd say that's a, a good way to put it, so usually a two-day stretch, um, and uh, uh, let's see, and if you go on my uh, YouTube page and look for, uh, look for the, f what was it called? The, the, the composing challenge. It's like, uh, the, the one hour composing challenge or something or other composing challenge. And I'll, I'll actually walk you through, uh, the process of me rising to the challenge of writing a piece. And I've got, I've videotaped the entire process for a piece that's called Space Monkeys, or you'll see me come up with the idea of what the piece should be called. Oh, here it is. The Space Monkey. Oop, that's his back. Bring me back. Bring me back. What did I do to you? I'm a space monkey. Not my fault. Uh... What are your biggest inspirations when working on video game music? Family, Beatles, friends and team, all the music that I've listened to, especially as a child and a teen and a college student. So as a child, I listened to a lot of Alan Sherman comedy music, uh, Stan Freeberg. Um, I watched a lot of, you know, TV, West Side Story, uh, Calypso music. And then as a, as a teen, uh, Beatles, Stones, you know, 70s kind of stuff, 70s, 80s. And then uh, college days, you know, I was in sort of an 80s band, New Wave. Um, I got to hear Ravi Shankar play a couple of times. I loved that. I got a classical um, a degree in, in music, you know, at a fairly classical-oriented school. Um, but I, I don't seem to have a very good memory uh, for classical music, so not so much. Um but it, some of it got into me through osmosis and the rules, uh, the theory. I was pretty good at the theory. So I could take that and whatever I'd write sloppily, I could look at and improve. But remember, I didn't, I, I'm not really that good at playing in real, real time. A little bit on guitar, but not on keyboard. Um, and MIDI didn't come along until, uh, until it came along. And, uh, when it did, I felt just absolutely set free. I felt that I could put melodies into the computer and then shape them the way that I wanted. So it was more like sculpting than it was like dancing. You know, I didn't have to do things in real time. And once I was set free of the uh, of performance in real time, uh, I felt that I could play my, my psychological strengths. Um, and what was the question again? Uh... What are your biggest inspirations when working on video game music? The fact that I can, and the fact that somebody wants something that I can do. That drives me very well. And I think that that's a lesson if somebody is looking at it for a life lesson. Um, 
career-wise, you're solving somebody's problem. You're finding somebody who has a need. You keep your ear open for what it is that people want and see if there's something that they want, that they are having trouble finding, that you can provide. That's the key to business interactions, and it can be a great key to artistic and uh, social interactions, too. Which vi which video game company did you most enjoy working for, and can you explain why? I most enjoyed working, I really enjoyed working for Dave Warhol, which wasn't a video game company, I guess real-time associates, um, but he was my guide into LucasArts, he was kind of my liaison, um, and uh, he was my connection, as I said, to uh, Intellivision, he was my connection to a lot of uh, Nintendo games, and uh, he was uh, just, it was very personal, he was very encouraging, and uh, gave me enough direction to, to head me off in the, right, uh, in the right ways, and left me alone enough. Uh, what else did I enjoy working with? Um, I liked working with uh, Graham Devine and Rob Landeros. They mostly left me alone while they did spectacular work on the games. Um, and so it was like being, you know, hey man, we're all wizards here. You take care of that. I'll take care of this. We'll put it together at the end. It'll be great. Um, and that was, that was beautiful. Um, Working with Brian Moriarty was, was fabulous. Um, he was always very respectful, always gave us a lot of uh, intellectual guidance, a smart guidance, but then backed off um, and, and, and treated us like, well, you guys know what you're doing. Um, and I think you get your best results that way. Uh, there are others, but I think that, that those are the first ones. I'm sorry about the ones that I'm not thinking of right now. Sorry, guys. Uh, I, it's been it's been a long, strange trip, and I've loved working with different companies for different reasons. Um, and uh, Humongous Entertainment, um, I kind of felt like uh, Ron Gilbert was uh, he was smart enough uh, to see that we had something to offer, um, and but he he was always he was, likes to be a little. Uh, He's got a direction in mind, um, and he likes to be a little bit, you know, well, okay, George, you can do it that way. He likes to be a little grumpy. He plays it grumpy that way. But the games and the work was so gratifying. So I loved working for, for those things. I love working for him. And, and uh, Ron, if you're, if you're watching this, I love you too. Um, you know, Ron, Ron's the kind of guy who, like, in later years would say, you know, or you know, after Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo comes out, he would like get angry because all his niece wanted to do was click on the topiary creatures over and over and listen to him sing. And he's like, you know, it, it's like it took away from the game, you know, <laughs> because because they liked the music so much. And I think he was kidding. Um, but that's that's kind of the persona that he would play. I miss you, Ron. Touch base sometime, okay? Uh, and he was really supportive of our careers, too. And Paul Grace uh, just was so wonderful with the Janes uh, fighting simulations at EA. Uh, he got our seal onto the box, and he, he uh, supported our kind of weird contracts. And, uh, gosh, so many good people. Thanks for asking that one, too. How many video games do you think you have been involved in? Your list of games is staggering. <sighs> Counting slot machines, it might be 300, 150 to, I mean, regular games, 100, 200. I don't know. As you say, it's staggering. Apart from your own work, is there one game that has blown you away with its music score? Well, we all love Monkey Island, but I think The Dig was really had a place in my life. Uh, I used to get regular massages and I would listen to The Dig uh, during those. And it's just a spectacular score. 
I was good friends with Michael Land, who wrote it, and the other Stooges, um, Clint Bajakian, and, uh, and Peter McConnell. And uh, I felt like I had a personal relationship with that music. I was there when Michael was excited about getting it onto a CD. Uh, and there was a moment when you know, he really busted his butt to make that score interactive. And he, he incorporated technology and music theory and heart and soul and mind. Um, and the results were fantastic. Uh, but by the time he was done, he said, you know what? Writing interactive music for a game, it just can't be done because you don't have, you know, access to the to the time. So, at the, you know, there's other stories about that conversation, but the main thing was that he, uh, uh, he was really glad to have a CD released on Angel Records, which was a very legitimate classical music label. Um, and I, I think it, it stands up to anything else that I own. Um, so, yeah, The Dig by Michael Land on Angel Records. Do you have any advice to anyone looking to enter into the music and or video game industry? Uh, yes. What now the question is, what is that advice? Well, you'll have to ask me a question specifically, but I would say, um, when you're picking, oh yeah, yeah, you know what? Uh, when you're just getting started, find people that are making games that are your friends that need something that you can do for them. So figure out what their needs are and see if you can fill those needs. And if it's music, awesome. If it's music and programming, great, learn it. If it's music and integration, great, learn that. Uh, hang out with them if these are people who are doing game jams, if these are people who are like student game development club, uh, hang out with them. You will find out if you like gamers. You will find out if you like developers. Um, excuse me. And you will uh, establish relationships. Uh, the way that I would judge if you have a choice of who you work with, ask yourself, do I like who I am when I'm with these people? Uh, if you like who you are when you're with people, that's a really good sign to go work with them. Um, and what other advice? Uh, keep your eyes open. Um, everything that I have to say about this is kind of in interviews and in books and stuff, but, but uh, when it happened to me, it was a different situation. Right now, there are a lot of buts and not that many seats. Um, but somehow, people seem to uh, be finding their way in these industries. So uh, don't ever give up hope or do give up hope. Uh, don't let people tell you that you have to learn everything in the world before you can qualify to get started because you do not have to learn everything in the world. There are some things that it's good to specialize in, and if you are a specialist, you may get hired for that specialty. If you have a combination of specialties that nobody else has, uh, you know, for instance, if you're very good at speaking Italian and you write um, puzzle music on the hurdy-gurdy, uh, then when somebody does a puzzle game a gypsy puzzle game and they live in Italy and that's their target market, then you're the person. So um, be aware of that. There's sort of a syndrome where people make excuses for the fact that you're not succeeding by blaming you uh, for not learning everything. You cannot learn everything. Um, sometimes you have to be the right shape Tetris piece, only four squares, be the right shape Tetris piece to fall into the right shape gap. Um, so build your character, uh, put your attributes into the, you know, strength and, uh, agility and wherever you're going to put them, but you only have so many attributes. So put them where they, put them where you want, build a character that's a certain shape and then a U shaped hole will open up in the universe. Um, 
and be ready to react and, and, and keep your eyes open and, and pop into that spot. Take out the trash cans for free. And when you get, and charge cheap, and when you get too busy, raise your prices. Not everybody backs me up on that, but that's how I did it. So either do it the way I did it or don't do it the way I did it. You will write your own story. The universe has your back. It may not seem like it. I keep reaching for my mouse. Have I got any advice? No, don't listen to me. Don't ever listen to anyone's advice. That's my advice. Have you played every video game you have ever created music for? And do you have a personal favorite game? Uh, no, I have not. And no, I do not. I'm playing words with friends now. Um, I would say that the the games I've written for, you know, the humongous games, because they're easy to play through. Seventh Guest, you know, I was able to conquer um, of my games. Uh, but, you know, the game that I probably had the most fun with was the LucasArts game Outlaws. And my friends, again, the Stooges at LucasArts, uh, wrote the music for that. Uh, but I played a lot. Of, it's a kind of corny first-person shooter um, in the Wild West, and I played that against Team Fat in the same building so we could hear each other yelling and that was a lot of fun. Um, so I would say Outlaws is my favorite game. If you could be transported into any video game you have worked on and live there for a day, which game would you choose and why? Not Seventh Guest. Not Wing Commander. Not Rad Gravity. Not Maniac Mansion. Pep's Birthday Surprise. Oh, we did a Winnie the Pooh game for Hula Bee. That'd be pretty sweet. Can you explain your other titles, such as The Fat Man and Team Fat? Uh, the Fat Man, you like like where I got my name? Um, I thought that I was going to be a hotshot when I moved to Austin, and I was uh, complaining to my brother that I was not being accepted as a hotshot. You know, I had come from Los Angeles. I had some pretty good uh, credits. You know, I'd done small things on big projects, you know, that involved Elton John and Peter Gabriel. Um, but uh, when I got to Austin, I thought, well, I'll be a big fish in this small pond. I'll smoke a big cigar. I'll put my feet up on the desk. I'll tell people they never work, they'll never they never work in this town again. I'll be the fat man of Austin. And my brother kept the name for me and started calling me Fat Man. Uh, and Team Fat, well, uh, when I started working with these guys, uh, again, trying to emulate, you know, that little foursome, the monkeys, the beetles, and, uh, you know, we needed a name. Team Bonsai from Buckaroo Bonsai. Team Fat. Why not? Oh, also, when I play disc golf, I always hit the first available tree. F-A-T. Did you ever get to meet any famous celebrities or music stars whilst working in the video game industry? Well, certainly, like, almost all of the game stars. Um, and, uh, yeah, I got, to, I got to meet stars one way or another, uh, not necessarily through the game business. But, uh, you know, to me, the really thrilling stuff was hanging out with uh, Nolan Bushnell and, and Ralph Baer, you know, who one or the other invented ga video games, the, like the idea of video games. Um, I felt, oh, well, I got to hang with Thomas Dolby a lot, and I, I still feel like I'm friends with him. Uh, he sang the song, She Blinded Me With Science. I got to jam with him, actually, on that song. Uh, I met some of the heroes of of synthesis, 
you know, Morton Sabotnik and, and uh, Roger Lynn, who invented the Lynn drum machine, um, and Dave Smith, who invented MIDI. Uh, I've met uh, Mark Mothersbaugh uh, various ways. Um, I met, uh, you know, my the, the video game archive that I helped start uh, had an event that in, involved some music stars, so uh, I got to hang out with... Uh, just for for a brief time with uh, Pete Townsend and uh, and uh, this is challenging my ability to remember nouns. Uh, Joe Walsh, uh, I I got them and, uh, and Jimmy Vaughn to sign a Guitar Hero controller. Uh, I've got pictures of myself with a bunch of these guys. Uh, Sid Meier's great, you know. I, like I say, you know, all all the all the video game guys. Uh, uh, Will Wright, you know, we all, we've all hung out. Uh, Hal Barwood. Hi, Hal. I saw your interview. Um, you know, we were, we were all just kind of drinking buddies. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm apologizing for the fact that, that, you know, a lot of these are white men, old white men now. Um, I'm happy to say that that's starting to change, and uh, uh, you know, let's let's look at let's let's try to smear over that part of it, um, and and improve and do better. Uh, actually, for a while, this is this is a little sidetrack, but I'm actually proud of the fact that as little as it was, uh, I would bring uh, I was friends with women and would bring them into meetings and bring them into parties at the game developer conferences and, and bring them into the business. Um, and uh, one of the jokes was uh, that uh, there were only two women in game audio and, and why are they both hanging out with George? Uh, you know, haha. Ha. But uh, yeah, because I had my uh, publicist and, and marketing person, Teresa Avalon, uh, was always at the dev conferences and uh, my wife at the time, Linda Law uh, would come to the conferences and they were tremendously brilliant people and they're still running the conferences that we started together uh, Project Barbecue for uh, for shaping audio on computers over the next five years influencing uh, hardware and software and uh, Project Horseshoe which is a think tank conference for um, uh, for solving game design's toughest problems uh, they're still running those. There's some brilliant people. So I don't know what it... Yeah, I met bona fide celebrities, but uh, the people that I really like are the people who are very capable uh, and and awesome. And uh, I, I cannot list all of them. Uh, hi, Dana Hanna. She's one. Oh, and Jennifer McWilliams. Yeah, great people. Just great people. Ellen Guan, uh, Chase Bithia. Uh, come on, let's shake it up a little bit. Uh, uh, da Danny Bunton, Danielle Berry, um, the inventor of Mule. Great, great person. We had some good times. Went out dancing. Do you have any funny or really memorable stories based around your time in the video game industry? Yes. What games and projects are you currently working on? Uh, I am producing a project. Ooh, nobody knows about this. I'm producing a project uh, called Marinate for a fictitious band that I belong to called uh, uh, Turtle Money Sandwich uh, with the brilliant writer Brian uh, Watkins, who, who's a, a slot machine game designer and just writes the sweetest songs. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm working on uh, little projects with the uh, local community uh and uh, and some people around here who hired me to do uh, videos and uh, produce their music. Not working on any games right now. Um, 
I think that there may be an age issue, but I'm, I'm happy to work, happy to work on games. Um, but, uh, most of what I'm doing is taking my vintage stuff, my old music and, uh, putting it out there for you fans to grab and listen to and play and enjoy. Uh, and that's a certain amount of work and, uh, I'm doing a little bit of promoting that, you know, touring the book as they say. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and I'm, oh, God, I'm keeping busy. Don't worry about that. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be building a base for a friend real soon. Uh, that's kind of exciting. Um, and I think there's a bunch of other stuff that I'm working on that I, it just isn't springing into mind. If I start thinking about it too much, I'm going to stress out that I haven't gotten to it. There's a client now! What are your top three video games of all time and why? Uh, I think we've covered that. What are your top three, uh, your favorite music artist or band of all time and why? I think we've covered that. If you could go for a drink with any video game character, who would you choose and why? Miss Pac-Man. I don't think I need to explain that one. Thanks for the interview. Mwah!